Hello everybody and welcome back to the Golang tutorial. So in this video we're going to be talking about for loops. Now there's a fair amount to cover when it comes to for loops, especially because for loops actually are the same thing as while loops in uh, in Go, which is different than a lot of other programming languages. And they've actually made these for loops pretty flexible in the way that you write them. So there's like five or six different styles of for loops you can write. So I'll try to cover them all, but just keep in mind that I might not go into extreme depth in each of these uh, these different paradigms of writing the for loop. So first of all, what is a for loop? I'm sure some of you are probably wondering what that is. Well, the idea behind a for loop is being able to execute the same block of code multiple times. So obviously you could understand why this would be useful, right? If we wanted to print something a hundred times, it's probably not a good idea to actually type the print statement a hundred times, right? Like I don't really want to write fmt.print line hello a hundred times if I want to print it a hundred times. And in fact, a big issue occurs too when you know you get asked to print it a hundred times by your employer or whoever it is. And then the next day they say actually print it 25 times or actually I want you to print it 10,000 times, right? You got to change all the code, rewrite a bunch of stuff to do that. Where if we use something like a for loop, all we would have to do is change one number and boom, we could modify that. So let me show you what a for loop looks like. Uh, and then we'll just get into some examples and understand how they work. So a for loop starts with the keyword for. Now, the only necessary thing for a for loop is the keyword for and these brackets. Now, this is going to seem weird because in other programming languages, uh, you actually need to write three parts to a for loop. That's the variable declaration, the condition, and then what you want to do at the end of each loop. So the increment or the decrement at the end of each loop. Now, with Golang, these work as while loops as well. Now, a while loop essentially loops while a certain condition is true. So for a for loop, what we can do is we can just write some condition here. So let's say we have some val x. So let's say x colon equals three. And maybe while x is less than five, we want to loop. Well, this is actually a valid for loop in Golang. We can say for x less than five, do this. And what that says is essentially while x is less than five, keep doing what's ever, whatever is inside of this for loop. Now we define the variable up here. We're checking the condition here. And what we'll need to do to make sure that this isn't an infinite loop is we need to modify the value of x. We need to add something to it so that at some point in time, uh, we actually escape this for loop, right? Because if I just wrote something like for true here, um, this is a condition. That's fine. I can write this here. It's true. That's always true, which means there's no way for me to escape this for loop, at least with our current understanding. And this will just go on forever and ever and ever and ever until the program crashes or until you tell it to quit. So keep that in mind that it's very easy to make what's known as infinite loops. And you always want to make sure that your loop has some way of ending uh, so that you don't get stuck in the issue of having to close your window or close the command prompt because you made an infinite loop. So anyways, what I'm going to do is just say x plus equals one here. And then up at the top, what I'm going to do is say fmt dot print ln. And let's actually print the value of x. So this is the first kind of idea behind a for loop. You have a variable, you write, uh, what is this saying? It's replace with x plus plus. Okay, that's fine. Let's just do x plus plus. Uh, what you, sorry, what you just saw there, I'm going to interrupt myself, uh, is I had x plus equals one. And Golang just told me to change it to plus plus because plus plus just adds one minus minus will subtract one that's known as increment. And then in case I haven't shown this, what plus equals does is simply add whatever the value is on the right hand side here to the value X. So this would add five to three, which would give me eight, right? But if I just want to add one, then I put plus plus. Now, the idea is that at the end of each loop, I'm going to add one to the value of X. So I can kind of keep track of where X is. So we start at three. We go ahead. We say, OK, is X less than three or is X less than five? Yes, it is because it's the value three. So we go ahead. We print three. Now we add one to X. So now we come back up to the top of the for loop. X is four. And we say, OK, is four less than five? Yes, it is. So we print four. We add one to X. What is that now? Five. We go back up to the top of the for loop. Is five less than five? No, it's not. So we break out of the for loop and we stop looping. That's the process behind this. So let's actually have a look at this and I'll show you. So CLS go run tutorial .go. So we print out the value three, four, and that's all we get for this for loop. Now, of course, I can start at something like zero as well. Uh, if I start at zero, then we should see Let's have a look zero, one, two, three, four, five, and say we wanted to include the value five, then I could change this to six or I could change this to less than or equal to. So then this condition will be true when X is five, which means we can print five. So let's go ahead and do that. And we get 
There you go, zero, one, two, three, four, five. Now there's a lot of practical uses of for loop. This is probably the one of the most used pieces of syntax um, in programming is a for loop. Uh, so it's important to understand how these work. So this is the first kind of design. You make some kind of variable here, you have a condition and then you increment it somewhere in the loop. Now the issue with this is you have to remember to do all this, right? You gotta remember to define the variable, you gotta put the condition, you gotta remember to increment it. So there's another style of for loop and I'll write it so that it does the exact same as this down here. Now this style um, does the exact same thing, it just looks different. So you say for, you define a variable, so let's say x less than equal to zero, you put a semicolon actually here, then you say x, you put your condition, so I'll say x less than equal to five, and then you say x plus plus, and then inside of here you say fmt.println x. Now this does the exact same thing as this. It's just a different way of writing it. So rather than defining the variable outside the loop and um, incrementing inside the loop, we say x is equal to zero, define that here, x less than or equal to five, and then x plus plus. So the formula goes definition or declaration of the variable, condition, some kind of increment, and we separate those by semicolons. Then we can go ahead and print that line, and let's actually run this. I'm just gonna comment this out. I haven't shown this before, but this is a multi-line comment. So if you do a forward slash and then an asterisk, and then at the end of wherever you wanna stop commenting out, you do an asterisk and a forward slash, it will comment out the entire kind of block uh, of that, so in between those two things. Okay, so let me run this now, and let's just make sure it does the same thing. Okay, so we get, if we look here and I scroll up, uh, do, 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 zero, one, two, three, four, five. So there you go. So that printed uh, all the way up to five, starting at zero. And of course we can add more than one if we wanted to at the end of this loop too. So I could say X plus equals two. And now what's gonna happen is we're gonna count by two. So if we run this and we have a look, we get zero two four, right? So we didn't print six because as soon as we got to the value six, that wasn't uh, valid for the loop. So we didn't enter it and we didn't go inside. Okay, so those are kind of the two main styles. So what you can do is you can write it like this where you just put the condition or you can write it with all of them at the top here separated by semicolons. And that's like the basics behind writing for loops. Now I'm gonna show you a few examples of how we use for loops so you, it makes sense to you why I've even shown you all this. Uh, but the other style, and I showed this at the beginning, right, is I can actually just do for like this if I wanted to. Uh, and this, what this will do is actually set up what's known as an infinite loop, which we talked about. So this is the same as writing like for true, if you just omit the true and just write for. But how do I get out of this? Well, there's actually two keywords that I need to show you that can be used inside of a for loop that are going to really mesh well with the example I'm about to show. So these two keywords are break and continue. Now what break does is actually just immediately exits the loop. So say that we're here, right? And as soon as we hit this break keyword, it doesn't matter what the value of X is. It doesn't matter if it's um, still satisfying this condition, X is less than or equal to five. It just breaks the loop and it goes immediately to the end of this bracket. It skips anything below it. It doesn't do anything below it. Uh, and then it continues the program from there. So as soon as I hit break, I jump from line eight to line 10 and I'm done. I'm done the full loop. Now what continue does is a little bit different. As soon as I hit continue, it does skip everything below it, but it actually immediately jumps to the top of the loop. So it goes back to the beginning of the loop and keeps running from there. So nothing changes with these counting variables. All it does is immediately just go back to the beginning of the loop so that anything below it no longer happens. So you can think of break, exits and goes to the end, continue, doesn't mess anything up, just goes right back to the very beginning. And there's many different uses for why we would wanna do something like this. So let's actually do an example. And what I wanna do is I wanna print out, um, I'm trying to think if there's a good way to do this. I wanna print out all the numbers that are divisible by five, seven, and nine that are in between zero and a thousand. So I'm gonna make my loop go up to a thousand. I'm gonna count by one, so just X plus plus. We're gonna start at zero and all the numbers that are divisible by, what was it I said, like three, seven, nine, I don't know, we'll pick some random ones, we'll print those out. So how can I go about doing that? Well, what I'm actually gonna do is make an if statement inside the for loop and I'm gonna say if X does not equal zero and, so we do this little and here, and X mod three equals equals zero. So that says if X mod three which is the remainder of X divided by three is equal to zero, which means three evenly divides X. Um, then that means it's divisible. So then after that we'll say, and 
x mod 7 equals equals 0 and x mod 9 equals equals 0. So if that's all true, then that means that x is divisible by 3, 7, and 9, then we're going to print out x. So I'm going to say fmt.println, let's just print x. And then what I'm going to say is continue. And what that means is just jump back to the beginning of the loop. Now, down here, what I'm going to say is fmt.println like this, and I'm just going to print a big n. So essentially, if the number is not divisible by, uh, what is it, by all these things, or this condition isn't true, we print n. Otherwise, we're going to print the actual number. So what this is going to do is it's going to make sure that when we find a number that's divisible by all of these things, we don't print n. We only print n when it's not divisible by that. Now, in fact, this is going to be, I don't want to actually print n. I just wanted to show you an example of when we would use continue, like say there was stuff down here that you don't want to do when this if statement um, doesn't happen. Well, you could, there's two ways to do this, right? We can use the continue statement, which will just go back to the top of the loop. Or I can put an else here and put this inside of here. Now, typically it's a little bit cleaner to use continue, but we can use the else statement as well. But actually for this example, I'm not gonna print n just cause in the output, I wanna actually be able to see these numbers, uh, which is gonna be hard to do if we print n. So let me erase that and let's boot this up here, run and see what we get. Okay, oh, so I didn't save my file, one second, so let's run this again. And there we go. So these are all the numbers that are divisible by three, seven, and nine that are in the range of zero and a thousand. So that's a cool example of how we can use a for loop is we can loop through a bunch of numbers and then we can check if they meet some condition. If they do, we can print them out, otherwise we don't have to. Now, in fact, what I'm actually gonna do now is I wanna say, let's print out the first number that satisfies this condition. So the first number where it's divisible by three, seven, and nine, and only that number. What I've done is I've made this a break. So as soon as this happens, we'll print the number and then break the for loop. So now what happens if we look at it is we should just get that first number that was in that list of values, which is 63, right? So that's the idea behind break and continue. And hopefully that's explained for loops to you. So I think with that, I'm gonna wrap up the video here. I hope you guys enjoyed. If you did, make sure to leave a like, Subscribe and I will see you in the next Golang tutorial.